we first 17? And this is 19.17. And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth, of forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Shall we kneel for prayer? Dear Father in heaven, as we have met on your holy day, we want to thank you for being here. We thank you for your angels that walk up and down around us and protect us from the evil. Amen. Dear Father, we want to thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in our hearts, changing us to be like you. Yes. And Father, we do ask that you will be with Elder Trust, that you will give him words from your desk to speak to us. We pray, Father, that as we learn these things and we come to a better understanding, <coughs> we will follow your word and that we will be guided by you and that we will find the safe place in the hall of your hand in these days Amen. to come. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, when I found out that Attorney Larson was going to be able to be here, uh, I thought we must have him. I was just recently editing his uh, um, presentation that he gave on Sunday at the camp meeting about recent Supreme Court decision. Now, he has really studied the background of these new appointees, such as Justice John Roberts. Incidentally, John Roberts is a member of the John Carroll Society, which, and John Carroll is the first Jesuit here in America. Uh, it's a society that honors the uh, judicial profession and has given awards to, I think, at least four of the current sitting uh, justices now. Of course, Rehnquist has passed away. But they also conduct the Red Mass. And this year, for the first time, President Bush attended the Red Mass. Mm -hmm. Why? I think he wanted to honor John Roberts. That's the way it works. It's all very close, you know. And, and uh, that is a Mass that they have held, oh, I think it was begun in the 13th century by Rome and Europe. And it's been for decades now in America. They honored the, uh, the justices. There's also a blue mass that's held to honor the uh, first responders, the uh, firemen, policemen, people like that. They have masses to put their blessing on this or that part of the population. So Rome gradually, gradually extends their tentacles. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you've been studying, uh, Dave. <clears throat> well, first of all, uh, what I was thinking about as you were telling uh, us about how there's been a transformation in this nation from Protestant principles to uh, Roman Catholic principles, I was remembering back in the 1970s and 1980s when my family and I would make trips and we'd be going through places, whether in Europe or Asia or Mexico, but I remember telling my wife and my daughter, I'd say, now, do you notice anything about this country? Maybe we would be in Italy or we would be in some Catholic country, and yeah, there's a different feel here, you know, it's not quite as clean, it seems like the people think different, the work ethic seems different. And then we'd go to a northern, you know, maybe to northern Europe to a more of a Protestant area, and I'd say, do you notice a difference here? And yeah, it seems like the people are just more industrious and everything's cleaner. Well, oh, in, in the days of Martin Luther, they had 150 Roman Catholic holidays a year, so they only worked about half the year, so they didn't get ahead very much. And what I think that we're seeing is the transformation in this country of where what used to be a Protestant nation, we're looking out and we're seeing what's becoming a Roman Catholic country. And I wanted to just relate more locally before we go to the Supreme Court. Could I say something sure. on a general thing, Dave? There's a chapter in here on the intervention of state. It's how Rome goes about taking <coughs> over a country like our nation. Um, and does it through the, uh, the welfare state and all of that. Our whole welfare system rests upon the, the National Council of Fishers. I'm just starting my fourth year as being an attorney, so I, just this last week I sat down and talked to a judge, and I talked to an old-time attorney who's been an attorney for over 30 years, 
And I said, I want to know, have you seen any transformation in the last 30 years? The judge had been a judge for about 20 years, and he was an attorney before that. So these are two old timers. And I said, you know, I've only been an attorney going on four years now. And, and is there a difference? They said, oh, yes, there's an amazing difference in what happens when people come into the district uh, uh, district court for the state of Oregon, that's where I'm, the 17th district over in Lincoln County. I said, well, explain to me. And the judge explained how in the past people had a fear. There was a fear factor or a reverence or whatever you want to call it for even the, ju the judge. That if the judge made a demand that generally speaking, even the defendants, even the people accused of crimes would come in, they'd have more proper decorum, they'd show more respect. And that gradually that's been wearing away and wearing away where people come in, they'll come in pajamas and then they'll be asked to leave. They'll come with uh, tank tops on or they'll come basically wearing very little at all and they'll be asked you have to leave. But people, and then if the judge hits the lectern and gives a demand, it doesn't affect them because they've lost all sense of, uh, and, you know, I may be generalizing, but there's been a, a gradual breakdown even among the so-called criminal element to where there's no fear and there's no respect. So what would make this transformation occur? And, and um, I asked the judge and this attorney, and of course, they said, well, there's, we think it's because of the increased use of drugs, and I agree. But I also think part of what it is is a difference in the whole moral fabric because we've got away from the Bible in the schools. The churches aren't teaching the importance of that there's morality of right and wrong, absolutes, that's gone if you talk to young people. And I go, I'm go, i invited at Law Day to go to the high schools and the, to teach the young people. I'm amazed at how little 17, 18 year olds who are in history class, they know so little about the history of this nation, about the basis for our government, and they don't have any idea, it's all relativism. They have no strong belief in right and wrong. Uh, you know, Dave, uh a big thing with the hippie generation was it was called the now generation. And they were trained to just forget about the past, forget about the future. Life is just a succession of now, so you live it to the fullest with pleasure right now. And that all came from the Jesuit trained philosopher Heidegger who, who wrote about this. These European philosophies came over here en masse as the, uh, as the professors fled Nazi Germany and they set up here in America, and it took about 20 years for it to take hold from between the 40s and the 60s. And by the time that generation was educated, we have happening here this kind of a, a moral collapse. So I guess as we see, as you look, that's why the, the first angel's message is so important. Now, how many people are going to wake up to it, I'm not sure, but it's our obligation to, to where does the basis for all respect come from. It comes from the fear of God. Amen. There's a creator. There's someone that we're to bow the knee to and that we're to show fear for. But if you get away from that and you lose that, then what's a judge? What's a police officer? What's anyone? If you don't fear God, you're going to have no respect for anyone else. You know, maybe we ought to mention here, how many people were at our camp meeting here? A few, but we might mention here that Norman Baker, who was one of our speakers, it, He's uh, quite a powerful black preacher, and he grew up on the streets of L.A., and he's even given studies to the leaders of the Crips gang, where you remember the Crips and the Bloods. But he said, he told us at camp meeting that there is a conscious effort being made now to create a war between the blacks and the Hispanics in the L.A. area. And in the 90s, uh, Ted Gunderson, who formed a, a he was one of the, he's an ex-FBI chief, and he formed a security agent uh, organization. And he has many contacts. And they warned that this kind of thing was coming. And that the Germans, uh, the German Luftwaffe, you know, basically has a base uh, in uh, um, New Mexico. I forget whether it's Holloman or which. Uh, yes, Holloman. Is it Holloman? Anyway, they have, he has informants that visit the restaurants and uh, places around, the, so they pick up on what's going on. And he, he revealed that 11 semi-loads of ammunition have been brought into the area down there, all kinds of weapons, and that the plan was when the strife broke out in the streets, the Luftwaffe pilots would come and fly in and strafe the 
the city streets. But these are the kind of things that we are hearing now, and these are credible individuals. Ted <coughs> um, it had a $22 million budget, 700 men under when he retired. If I may just jump to another, as I mentioned, as you were speaking, things were entering my mind, and I'm sure everyone in the, the audience had other things that entered their mind as well, but I read a meteorologist report about Katrina, how it went from a Category 5 to a Category 4, it had 175 mile hour winds heading straight for New Orleans. At the very last minute, the way he described it, it said a little puff of warm air came out of the Midwest, shifted it slightly eastward, and reduced the wind speeds from 175 to 145. And they said the, even the meteorologists could not figure out where this little puff of uh, warm air came from. But I'm thinking that the Lord's merciful. I believe that this was a judgment. And yet, if that New Orleans were to take a direct hit with 175 mile an hour winds, it, it, it would have just been leveled completely. And maybe this is a merciful God who puffed his lips and went a little bit of warm air just at the last instant to show one last. Mercy is mixed with judgment. And in Rita, uh, when it was a Category 5, uh, one person who was listening to the news more than I was told me that uh, they heard that the eyewall was the biggest eyewall in recorded history for these hurricanes, 70 miles across. Uh, it had winds, wind gusts over 200 miles an hour and 80 foot waves. They it wiped out just loads, just scores and scores of oil rigs in the uh, Gulf of Mexico. Um, but I know that the real reason that you were asking me to be here was to talk a little bit about the Supreme Court. And uh, for those of you who were happened to be at camp meeting this year at the Sunday talk, I went, I put on the blackboard, and I don't have it in my memory, but I'm going to try to do it again. But the history of um, Supreme Court justices in the United States uh, from 1787 or 1789 until right up until the present time. And it was amazing to look at the first century of the Supreme Court. During that time, there was one Roman Catholic, the most that was ever on the Supreme Court, one justice who was Roman Catholic. Then by the 1920s, there had been, again, a Roman Catholic judge, but never two at the same time. But by 1980, you had two Roman Catholic judges, and I may be a little off on these dates. Then, of course, you had three. Now you have four. John Roberts is a Roman Catholic. Who are the other ones, just so the people know? Uh, Justice Thomas, Galila, Kennedy, and now Roberts. So before Roberts was uh, nominated, I was thinking in terms of, uh, is the makeup of the Supreme Court, I was thinking more of gender. Are they going to replace Sandra Day O'Connor with another female? I wasn't even thinking about the religious makeup, but I found it very amazing that uh, George Bush nominated and he was confirmed the fourth, now he's the Chief Justice, he's Roman Catholic. So now I got thinking, I'm going to look at the religious makeup of this newest uh, justice. Can I say something here today? Uh, I find it very interesting, this issue, that the first issue that uh, Roberts, by the way, there is a man here who told me about the procession going into the Supreme Court. Is he here today? I, I just I just heard okay. it from someone that watched it on TV. Okay, this last speak week. real loud so it picks up. Uh, it, he likened it to a Catholic procession. Yes. Uh, someone else saw that too, like a Catholic procession when the Supreme Court uh, was initiated this time. Uh, very interesting. At the Red Mass, they had a lot to do with it, the Red Mass. Oh yeah, well, the Red Mass is uh, an incredible thing. <clears throat> so I quickly checked on Harriet Myers. And everyone started saying, well, she's a Protestant, she's an evangelical. But I, I found the New York Times had an article on October 5th, and they said Miss Myers, born Roman Catholic, became an evangelical Christian sometime in her mid-30s or later in life. And then later in the same article, it says Miss Myers attended Mass at St. Jude Chapel in downtown Dallas while she was a pra practicing attorney. Uh, and now how, what did her friends say? It says, but as important as her professional trajectory, friends and family of Ms. Myers say it is the influence of religion on her approach to issues of political and legal importance. 
Uh, after joining Valley View Christian Church, she began teaching a Sunday night class for first, second, and third graders. But they're saying her closest friends is that religion, her religious background is what's the driving force in her legal thinking and legal decisions. Uh, that, that, is, uh, that is very, very interesting. Let me grab some of this stuff here. Um, <clears throat> she seems to be kind of a stealth candidate, and this is frustrating to even the right-wing conservatives, as you know from from the news. Um, some have postulated wondering whether she's being put on the court to look out for the interests of uh, the uh, House of Bush for the, for the next 20 years. Um, did you have something else about that? Well, I would just say that the real issue, of course, on the news, and I'm sure all of you are hearing this, is everyone's concerned about how will she vote on Roe v. Wade on the uh, right to life versus uh, uh, you know, the abortion, abortion issue. But I think that everyone in this room needs to know that that's a side issue. The true issue is church and state. And that's a side issue, but the issue is how are the Roberts and Myers, how are they going to be on issues that will affect us as Seventh-day Adventists on church state issues? And um, from what I just read from the New York Times article, uh, she puts her personal religion very much at the for forefront of her decisions. And of course, Roberts, um, I believe it's the very same case for him. He's bringing forth some uh, newspaper articles here that the first issue that the Supreme Court's hearing this term, or one of the first issues, is whether Oregon had the right uh, to pass a law granting a physician-assisted suicide. Now, of course, <coughs> Just as Louisiana is the only uh, jurisdiction out of the 50 states that has inquisitional law, everyone else has English common law, Louisiana is uh, Roman law, Oregon's the only state that has physician-assisted suicide, and in fact, in the whole world, there's only one other place that allows this type of activity. Do you know where it is? Uh, yes. So it's only two places in the world, Holland and Oregon. So the question is, what would Roberts, who everyone was, not everyone, but a number of people were critical because he was a member of the Federalist Society. The Federalist Society, uh, federalism is the idea that states still have rights and that there's, a, there's this tension between the federal government and the states and the power that's uh, shared or you know, the tension of power between the two. Because, Dave, the, uh, the drift has been from the federal government to basically <coughs> usurp all the states' rights. Of course, if they impose this kind of military infusion of troops in a national disaster, they'll just sweep states aside. But the whole thing has been moving in that direction, so it's been interesting to see that he's a strong, staunch member of the Federalist Society, which upholds states' rights. And of course, that was the hue and cry of the Southern Confederacy in, in the Civil War. And can you tell me anything, Dave, about what Rome's position is in this controversy between federal power and state power? Well, that's, that's what I believe is the irony, that, as I see it. Uh, let's go to all the Catholic justices, Scalia, Thomas, Kennedy, and now Roberts. They would, they're all conservatives on the Supreme Court. So you would believe that as conservatives, they they have a position that the Constitution should be uh, read in an original sense. That's what they like to say. That's what they like to say, that they want to read the Constitution as the Founding Fathers wrote it with their intent in mind. Strict constructions. Not as, they don't view it as a liberal does. The liberal views the Constitution as a breathing, living, uh, evolving. evolving document that needs to be read for the times that we're living in. Uh, however, what I find, I, the irony is that these conservative justices who are Roman Catholic, they put a new spin on what the Founding Fathers' take was. For example, Jefferson was very clear in his uh, wall of separation between church and state. Yet the late Justice uh, Rehnquist said that that was bad history and that there wasn't this wall of separation between church and state. So the real issue is church and state the Roman Catholics who claim to be originalists, that they're going to read it as the Founding Fathers wrote it, 
but they're not. They're putting their own Roman Catholic spin on it. And to answer your question about uh, where would they stand, well, they appear to be conservative. They appear to be federalist. And yet we know that Rome's true position is that they like a strong central government because it's easier to have information on everyone. It's e easier to control one rather than 50. One king, right. Uh, this is very interesting, Dave. I'm glad you uh, dealt with this because I've been watching this. You have, with Roberts, the state's rights issue, which we should have put him on the side of physician-assisted suicide, or at least the state has a right to determine whether or not they want that, as opposed to the federal government's position, which is officially in opposition to this. <clears throat> what makes this even more interesting for me is what, the knowledge of what happened under Nazi Germany, which, you know, the, the bishops all across Germany held a breakaway of mass for Hitler when he died after the war. And uh, they had a concordat, as you know, between Ger Nazi Germany and the Vatican, uh, uh, masterminded by Pacelli, who later became the pope known as Hitler's pope. And it's all an incredible story of how Rome worked to catapult Hitler into power. And they had euthanasia on a massive scale, of course, in the death camps, and also for the mentally enfeebled and and people who were considered unfit for life. So this has been an interesting thing to me that Rome is trying to take officially a, a staunch position opposing euthanasia when they supported it so through their through their service in Nazi Germany so much. I think it's a public relations thing. Uh, Rome, it's been said, is as clever as a fox when she's not in power, when she's trying to achieve power. Mm -hmm. So it's, we can see where Robert's true allegiance is. If it's to the Federalist Society and those conservative ideas, then he should come down. Even if he had personal uh, belief that, that the Oregon law is, if personally he believes the Oregon law is uh, not right, he wouldn't support it. But he should, if he's being true to what he claims to have been, which is a Federalist Society member, then he would say, even though I disagree with this, the state of Oregon has the right to pass such a law, and we're not going to interfere. But it doesn't appear like he's going to come down on that side. It appears as if he's going to show his true color, and he's going to back the federal government's position, which in a roundabout way is backing Rome, although they claim to be right to life. Mm -hmm. uh, secretly, they're, they're not. Well, we know they're not because uh, already over the course of history, 19th century historians claimed that about 100 million were killed by Rome mm -hmm. because the, of course, when you talk about right to life, does a heretic have a right to life? No. No, no. there's no rights for error in Rome, there's, so a heretic has no right to life. And very interesting, you have to understand how Rome thinks, and it reminds me again and again of what happened with the Bohemians. <coughs> and in Bohemia, you had a Protestant nation and those warriors under God were undefeatable. Rome sent one crusade after another, and the Lord worked miracles to protect them and, and to give them the victory. But finally they gave in when Rome said, look, let's not have any more of this war. Let's, uh, let's establish certain articles, and Ellen White tells about it in Great Controversy. But the right to interpret the articles remained with Rome. So you see, he who interprets the law is the real lawgiver. And that is what Rome understands very well about the issue of gaining dominance and hegemony over the Supreme Court. There you have the apex of the judicial branch of our government now coming under the control of Rome, along with loads of appellate judges and circuit court judges appointed under Bush. I might mention that from my own brief experience in law school that I went to some Federalist Society uh, meetings. I thought about possibly joining the organization as a conservative group. I saw that all the leadership of our local chapter were Roman Catholic. Uh, instead, I became a member of, uh, of a more obscure group. It doesn't have a national standing. It's called the Second Amendment Society. Amen. But, uh, but to make a long story short, uh, I saw that these young men who were taking the leadership position in our law school 
were Roman Catholic, and I was looking at their grades, and they it wasn't that they were the top of the class, but somehow they had a, the ability or the backing to get into top positions. And just recently I was listening to the radio and I heard the name of, uh, of the replacement for someone who had to step down from the state government. I'm forgetting who it was off the top of my head. This is over in Oregon. But it was one of these same young men who graduated the same time I did. And now he's being groomed and he's being moved right into a position of power. And uh, he's Roman Catholic. So I don't know, uh, you know, the, the uh, sled is greased for them in some ways. I don't know how it gets greased, but they can slide right into the, the positions that, that are going to put them where they can do the most damage, I guess is how I would put it. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, jumping back to New Orleans for a moment, just this week I heard the general who's in charge of this, and these were his words, they were asking him, how did it go in Texas after the experience in Louisiana? How did their response to Rita go? And this is the, the military, he's not a National Guard, he's the actual just U.S. military. And he used these words, he quote, he said, I hate to say this, but we're getting good at this. And he says, you know, with practice you get better and better. He says, I would say it was excellent and it's getting better each time. So it's almost like, and, and he said it, he hedged it, like I hate to say this, because maybe he has a, a memory of when this would have been something that people would have stood up and said, no, enough is enough. The disaster's over, please leave, or whatever. But they're being groomed for something bigger, I believe. Um, and, and you can see it, that the, the military is being prepared to, uh, to take over regions of this country in case of uh, not just a nat uh, natural disaster, but a uh, terrorist attack or an avian flu outbreak. And uh, at camp meeting, I mentioned the avian flu that over in Great Britain, Tony Blair's government was secretly getting 300 and some thousand burial spots because they're anticipating that type of loss of life in Great Britain. So the question is, is this, is it going to be a natural outbreak or is it going to be man-made? I, I don't know. But I know that Satan uses, I think Sister White used the terms, the laboratories of nature, or he, he manipulates things like this for his own advantage. And uh, there's so many ways now that this could come about, whether it's a terrorist attack or what would be called a natural outbreak or a natural calamity. But things are ripe for Rome to strike suddenly, for this nation to be shut down into martial laws, and for Sunday laws to be passed. Well, when you mention striking suddenly, uh, Rome has a policy of honeycombing. And then when she determines that the stage is set, she moves exceedingly swiftly. And we saw this with Eastern Europe, uh, when um, Solidarity Labor Union uh, finally got the victory there in Poland, within a matter of weeks, all, and one after another, the Eastern European nations uh, collapsed as the Roman Catholic faithful and the masses were brought out into the streets. And Rome had observed and watched and when more than 50% of the Orthodox priests were prepared to accept the principle of papal primacy, they knew the time had come for them to strike. So Rome watches, she's watching all of these developments more carefully than you can imagine, because the day is coming when she is wanting to claim this nation fully for herself. Another thing that is very interesting and in all of this legal business is that Rome is now teaching their young people that America was established by Rome and that the principles of our Declaration of Independence were taken right out of Cardinal Bellarmine, who was one of the main opposers in the Counter-Reformation to Protestantism. This is what the Catholic young people are being taught now. So they're already trying to move into the position of claiming this nation. They started it, uh, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus uh, discovered it, and uh, this is their nation. And incidentally, do you know how the words under God got into our Pledge of Allegiance? And who was behind it? The Knights of Columbus. So very interesting. They brought the words in, and now it's become an issue with the atheists. So it becomes one more focal point in the battle, and with each 
of these culture war battles, Rome tries to gain another degree of leverage for her ultimate takeover of this nation and the imposition of the mark of the beast. Have you ever stopped to think what it would be like when the mark of the beast is imposed, and it will be, Sunday observance required by law, and if you don't go along with it, you can't buy or sell. Did anyone not buy anything this last week or sell anything that last week? You know, how much of our life is spent doing this, and what kind of an impact will that have on the faithful? I, I think very few people are prepared for that. I know I'm not fully yet. I wanted to just briefly jump back to Justice, or well, she's not a justice yet, but Harriet Myers, who's been nominated to be a justice. Uh, the same, I think it was the same article in the Wall Street Journal, that I, or, or the New York Times, but I may, I may have got it somewhere else. This evangelical church in Dallas that she belongs to is undergoing a split right now. The church is being split right down the middle. There's a group that's going off to establish a second church the issue that's splitting them is how much do you bring contemporary rock music and contemporary worship style into the church. So one group is leaving. It, the, the article I read did not specify which group was which, but she's going with the splinter group. But, but I, what's going to be interesting for me is to find out which position the splinter group is uh, advocating, whether they're advocating holding on to the traditional hymns and the traditional values of this church or whether she's splinting off of the group the same for a more upbeat uh, contemporary type format. I just wanted to bring you what uh, the situation is here with the, the president considering responses in event of the outbreak of uh, the avian flu. President Bush expressed concern Tuesday about the threat of a global flu epidemic he said he had been reading a book on the uh, 1918 flu epidemic. Anyone know how many people died in that one? Oh, boy. How many? How many? I can't remember what the number was, but uh, it was tens of millions. Anyway. Uh, he expressed concern Tuesday about the threat of a global flu epidemic and said Congress should consider letting the U.S. military play a broader role in enforcing quarantines and other emergency measures. Of course, some people wondered then, I heard on the news, what if the soldiers come down with the flu? Um, Bush said the possibility of a virulent new strain of avian influenza spreading rapidly around the world raised difficult questions about a president's ability to direct an effective domestic response effort and the federal government's authority to carry it out. And uh, he ha is planning to, the headline says, Bush may use troops for flu. Another headline, here's Seattle Post Intelligence, troops may join flu fight. Bush sees military battling pandemic. Um, he suggested pass, pass, dispatching American troops to enforce quarantines in any areas of the United States with outbreaks of the killer virus. Well, it's, a, it's an appalling thought because you may be shut off from loved ones, you may and you can't get through, and they can't get out. And you don't know just what the government may decide to do with those who are infected. Back in the 1990s, about a decade ago, it came to my attention that Mikhail Gorbachev had been uh, moved to uh, the Presidio with a group called the State of the World Forum and every year, right about this time of year, in October, and I think they still hold these uh, yearly meetings there, leaders from around the world will show up there and they have three or four days of meetings at the Presidio or at, or at San Francisco in which they discuss different issues, religious issues of <coughs> global nature, how the global spirituality is going to pan out in the future, economic issues, military issues. But um, I remember some receiving emails. My daughter was at Yale at the time, and there were some young men who had slipped into this meeting, and they were saying what they were hearing was just appalling, that there were people standing up there talking about the overpopulation and that it had to be uh, pruned down by at least 25%. It says, don't, for those of y'all that... One of the meetings called for, at, at 
the Presidio called for 90% reduction of the world's population. Correct. And but uh, and they know that's a lot. So initially, I think that they're shooting for 25, but the ultimate goal, goal you're right, is 90%. Um, but they said, it's not for you to have to worry about this. We're the, I forget the term that they use, like riders of the pale horse, we'll pick and choose who the defective seed are and how this is gonna happen. So when I hear about this avian flu, whether it's something that's naturally occurring in nature, it may be, I, I don't know. But whether it's being manipulated by uh, these, yeah, these monsters who believe that they are the elite and that they know who should be weeded out, who shouldn't be. But we're all facing uh, grave times just ahead of us, and we have to take steps to be ready, and mainly spiritual steps, uh, to daily be uh, learning to commune with God. I think I've mentioned this before in meetings, when Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, that's of course how he lived his life. He was constantly under attack, and he constantly responded by scripture, by the word of God. But aren't we exactly in that same position that Christ was facing? I believe we are. I mean, I face things that make me feel fearful, but then I remember the word of God, uh, uh, that we, we're not the perfect love cast without fear. I face obstacles and I think there's no way that I'm going to be able to overcome this obstacle, whether it's privately or personally, but then I remember that uh, we can do all things through Christ which strengthen us. Mm -hmm. uh, so on a daily basis, I'm trying to learn to live that way, where I live by the Word of God. Every time a new obstacle comes up, I think of a Bible promise, and that's how I try to respond to it. And I think that that's how we all have to start trying to live here at the end of time because it's a terrible time. Mm -hmm. uh, of our own strength, we have nothing. Mm -hmm. we, we're like a little bug that can be squished. But with Christ, we have everything. We have all power. And uh, Well, the geography does have a lot to do with the thinking of a person. Uh, this is why Ellen White recommended country living. It promotes freedom, independence. Uh, a, a noble moral independence and a love for God as you see the mountains, as you see the things of nature, your thoughts are drawn in that direction. I know just going into the city to do some business and run some errands, it has a, a shocking effect on me after I've been out in remote areas for, for quite a while. Now I wonder if uh, we have just a few more minutes closing, is there anyone, there was a, a brother here who uh, saw something interesting in the uh, Dallas. Would you like to tell the group about that? Well, I was just traveling from Dallasport, Washington to the Dallas. Speak, speak really loud. You can stand okay. up if you want. So everyone can hear. Well, if you want. I said I was traveling to the Dallas, Oregon on the highway or freeway and I was going to the Home Depot, which would be at the far west end. This was Friday, which yesterday, and this is Friday morning. And as I was driving, I met a military convoy traveling eastbound on the freeway, and every position in that convoy, all the, the individuals were manning their guns. I've never seen that. I've seen a lot of military convoys in my lifetime going down the highway. I've never seen one where they're all individually manning their their uh, arms on, they were like Bradley fighting vehicles, but only they're a little bigger, uh, and they're, they're on rubber tires. And these individuals were all manning their guns, and the guns were all pointed straight out at traffic. I mean, and I, it really struck me as odd. And Vern, you said you yeah, saw that. on Tuesday, I, I saw, as I was going down towards Cascade Locks, uh, I saw the same thing, military convoy coming to east. And the men were sitting up there and they had their masks on, so the bugs would get them in the face. Same thing. Well, this is interesting because in New Orleans, they showed on the news uh, General Honore, three-star general, who was controlling the situation there with the National Guard, I believe it was, and uh, he was ordering the troops there to put their guns down, pointed toward the ground, so they were not in a threatening posture pointing out toward the people. But here you have, on the highway, Highway 84, 
around the dowels with the guns pointed at the traffic and, and the people at large, all manned in a state of readiness, which may be because of that, I don't know what justification they would try to produce for that, but just recently, uh, uh, just this week I believe it was, three bomb makers were captured over in Iraq who were skilled bomb makers. They had made hundreds of these roadside bombs that are afflicting our troops over there. And they, they said under interrogation that 19 of their group had made it into the United States and one of the areas they were targeting was the subway system of New York. So the, immediately the subway system went on high alert there. But I think one of the lessons out of all of this is that the uncertainty of the times that we live in at any time, uh, you know, we know that some 50,000 of these pop-up barricades have been installed in the highways around America. This has been going on for several years now that are capable of stopping a 20-ton truck with the push of a button, they pop up and block the traffic. Likewise, these squares, uh, I know coming through Nebraska, for coming back from a trip, we saw them under every overpass and a Department of Transportation fellow said that they were for the purpose of frying the electronics in time of crisis so that the, the vehicles since 1984, I believe it is, have generally electronic ignitions and the diesels, they only came in about 95, I think. But those, the electronics would be fried and the cars would just stop and all traffic would come to a standstill. So they have been planning, planning, planning the control of the masses now for decades. And under uh, Reagan's administration, they had Rex 84, right? some of you may remember that. Well, a top secret program for putting uh, masses of the population in concentration camps if the, if the government so deemed it necessary. So the things we saw in the 20th century in Europe are being planned for this country. And particularly as Rome gains power, we are going to increasingly get into a situation where we need the the step-by-step uh, -step guidance of the Lord and direction about where we live, where we, uh, how we will function, and a knowledge of God's providence and His protecting power. Because remember that Psalms 46 and Psalms 91 are going to be the great psalms that God's people repeat in the great time of trouble, when God's people will be sustained by the hand of God. After the close of probation, no more martyrs and angels will feed God's people. So we have a thrilling future ahead. All of these things, I must say, they it causes me to lift up my head as the redemption draweth nigh. It to me is a vindication of the things that we have held as Bible believing, historic Seventh day Adventists. And the orientation that you have as a Bible-believing Seventh-day Adventist is more precious than you can imagine. Because one of the most greatest dangers of putting yourself in an environment where spiritual formation, celebration, new theology and all this, you lose your foundation. It's like you get severed from your roots in the Lord. But the Lord wants us to truly fear God. That's a big dimension of the gospel that's been lost. And to worship the Creator. And when I think of that, when I'm out in the mountains and I think that my God is the Creator. It just expands your mind just to, to think of it and to, to, to worship Him. We're not worshiping a hierarchy. We're not worshiping a church leadership. We worship the Creator. Amen. And that's what any other worship is idolatry. And so these are fundamental dimensions <coughs> and the Creatorship of God is tied all in, of course, with the Sabbath. And as we see the Lord's mighty creative power we witness it on our Sabbath walks and all. It reminds us of the power He has to create His image in our souls. So on one hand, you have the image of Christ in God's people. On the other hand, you have the rest of the world worshiping the image of the beast. Very, very interesting. Any other comments? Grab your brother. Um, I've always wanted to know what this, uh, when the National Sunday Law is passed, what's this going to look like now? Are they going to have mass at a, an NFL game? I can't imagine all those, uh, you know, uh, hedonistic people out there flocking to their local churches. Well, the, for one thing, it will be apostate Protestantism that leads out in the persecution here in the New World and Romanism in the Old, she said. So, actually, our greatest adversary on that score is apostate Protestantism in this country. They'll give the right hand to, to Rome. 
and uh, just how all of the details of it will work out. But Ellen White says in, uh, in her discussion of this that the worldlings will alike be deceived along with the uh, Protestants and Roman Catholics that have joined and the miracle working power will be uh, quite overwhelming. Let me see if I can find that quickly here. Yes, here it is. And this is Great Controversy 589, 588, 589. The line of distinction between professed Christians and the ungodly is now hardly distinguishable. You know, this is the 1911 edition. What would she say today? Yeah. You know, I was blowing, uh, blowing in um, insulation in my parents' attic when I was a young man, insulating their house. It's an old 200 year old house. And I found an old newspaper from the uh, 1880s, I believe it was, in there. And when I read it, I felt like I was reading Ellen White. It had a moral tone to it. Just like I was telling you earlier about the general thinking of the Protestants in America in the mid-19th century was right down the line of Great Controversy 581. But listen to this. Church members love what the world loves. Is that happening? The Saddleback Church? Now it's been conducting these seminars across the land in these structured churches. They have hard rock, and the pastor says, we're not going to turn it down. And the media calls it the flock that likes to rock. And how the pastor determined what he was going to have was he sent out little cards to the whole, you know, 19,000 people in the church and asked them what their main station was that they listened to. And it was the main hard rock station in the area, so that's what he brought in. And he saw as much his uh, membership just mushroomed as soon as he did that. And so church members love what the world loves and are ready to join with them, and Satan determines to unite them in one body and thus strengthen his cause by sweeping all into the ranks of spiritualism. This is all very, very interesting. I don't know if you've been noticing the resurgence of Kabbalah also, Jewish Kabbalah, amongst the Hollywood set. It's just amazing, all of these different dimensions of uh, mysticism and spiritualism. Papists who boast of miracles as a certain sign of the true church will be readily deceived by this wonder-working power, and Protestants, having cast away the shield of truth, will also be deluded. Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power, and they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long-expected millennium. Now, there's another very interesting thing that happens right after the close of probation when the death decree is passed that I find very, very interesting. And that is that the people will have she says, the forms of religion will be continued by a people from whom the Spirit of God has been finally withdrawn, and the satanic zeal with which the Prince of Evil will inspire them for the accomplishment of his malignant designs will bear the semblance of zeal for God. So they will believe that they are having zeal for God when they pass the death decree, the universal death decree. As the Sabbath has become a special point of controversy throughout Christendom, and this is one reason why the Sabbath is so critical. It anchors us to the Creator God. It anchors us to the ancient story of, of creation there in Genesis. It, it shows that we are a people set apart from all of this. And religious and secular authorities have combined to enforce the observance of the Sunday. The persistent refusal of a small minority to yield to the popular demand will make them objects of universal execration. That's hatred mingled with contempt. It will be urged that the few who stand in opposition to an institution of the church and a law of the state ought not to be tolerated, that it is better for them to suffer than for whole nations to be thrown into confusion and lawlessness. Can you see the thinking developing along that line with this avian flu thing, with the terrorism, war on terror, etc.? Anyone who's outside the mainstream, anyone who's different, is immediately somewhat suspect. <clears throat> The same argument 1,800 years ago was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. Incidentally, the European definition of a terrorist already is one who goes against the established order. And so all that has to happen is a slight change in the shade of meaning of terrorism and all these patriot acts which remove all your liberties can be applied against you. 
uh, Norman Baker was telling at the camp meeting of how, what was it, a, a relative of his, I believe it was, <clears throat> was uh, arrested for taking a, uh, checking out a book. He was wanting to study more about Al-Qaeda, and he went to the library and he checked out a book on Al-Qaeda, which triggered an FBI investigation of him. Uh, that's the kind of world we're living in now. And in, in the Inquisition, of course, they burned the books first, and then they burned the people. And they wanted to know what the people were thinking. And the issue of hate speech is getting to be a big one again now. There's legislation again. I have House approves anti-hate bill, freedom of speech now in jeopardy. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about that. Our time is just about out. <clears throat> but we'll get back to great controversy here. The same argument Caiaphas used 1,800 years ago that was brought against Christ by the rulers of the people. It is expedient for us, said the wily Caiaphas, that one man should die for the people and the whole nation perish not. This argument will appear conclusive and a decree will finally be issued against those who hallow the Sabbath of the fourth commandment, denouncing them as deserving of the severest punishment and giving the people, after a certain time, liberty to put them to death. Romanism in the old world and apostate Protestantism in the new will pursue a similar course toward those who honor all the divine precepts. The reason why we're tracking all of these things as a religious liberty ministry is they're all steps in this process that are all ultimately going to be forced down. If you just step back and look at the 90s, you had Bill Clinton who was trying to bring a communist revolution in this nation, appointed Opus Dei head of FBI, all kinds of Opus Dei members, involved with, Opus, with, F, with the FBI, and who spread terror among people who still believed in the U.S. Constitution. <clears throat> but there was a tremendous grassroots reaction. There were 800 and some organizations that sprang up to fight for liberty and to fight for the Constitution. So a change came. As soon as Bush was elected, mind you, both of those, those fellows go to the Bohemian Grove. You know about Bohemian Grove. You, Bohemian Grove is where the world's elite go, the, all the world leaders go there, and they have rituals that they go through. Uh, one of them is the, uh, what is it called, the, uh, where help me on this, the creation elimination of, of, cremation of, of, cremation of conscience. Care. 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 Cremation of care, right. And it's designed to stifle conscience so that leaders can do what they have to do. Before 9-11, for instance, FEMA moved into New York City. And I spoke personally with a man who had a search and rescue dog, worked on search and rescue teams. He was asked to come to New York City. He chose not to. The day before 9-11. Uh, there are loads and loads of questions still, of course, about 9-11. And uh, I hope you have opportunity to see some of the uh, DVDs, such as In Plain Sight <coughs> and others. But the the idea of military involvement, the government involvement, in this kind of thing has been around for decades. Way back in the time of Kennedy, they had, a, they had a, the Northwoods document where the American government was contemplating having an incident, creating an incident to raise a war fever against Cuba so they could invade Cuba, and that would involve uh, having terrorist incidents in American cities such as Washington, D.C. So this is nothing new. This is something governments have done for centuries and millennia, and it pays to have wisdom and, and get, try to get behind the scenes and see what's really going on. I believe our time is up now. It's been wonderful to be with you all. We've had a wonderful Sabbath day with each one of you. And we wish you the Lord's blessing. And remember, when we follow his word and we're obedient to his word, and to his counsel. The, the law of God is a tremendous defense against so many, many things. And the inner, it's a hedge that the Lord would like to protect us with. And in the inner depths of the soul, we need to really know our God through absolute self-surrender and bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And Christ will guide you and your family through these last days safely through to glory. He wants to do that. He is infinite, and He can focus on you an infinite number of ways of protecting you and guiding you 
and solving the things that you are destined to come up against. And so we have a wonderful God who is infinite in power. There's no measure to his power. And he will use that power as he chooses for the protection and defense of his people. But many of us will be martyred. Kind of inspiration is plain. Many will be martyred. But that is a great glory to suffer as our master did. To have the be, be a partaker of the sufferings of Christ. So many of us will be martyred, she tells us, but after the close of probation, no more martyrs. And uh, then shortly, as the after the seven last plagues, Jesus will appear in the clouds of glory. And those who have died in the faith of the three angels' messages will be resurrected to see the whole event of the entire second coming with the hand holding the law in the heavens, the fiery law, and the entire event of the whole sky filled with angels. It's going to be glorious. Let's be on the right side Amen. of the great controversy. Let us, let us kneel in dedication as we close. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we have considered now some of the signs of the time, some of the development, developments that are taking place in many, many areas that vindicate the faith that we have in the spirit of prophecy and in the Bible. Lord, we thank you for your protecting care, for your watch care over each one here, for your love, for your justice, for your mercy, and for the truth that you have been pleased to reveal to us. May we go deep into the Word of God. May we go deeply into the Spirit of God and be baptized with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure as we bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. And Lord, help us most of all to be fully surrendered to Thee and be ready and waiting to meet Thee when Thou shalt come in the clouds of glory together with those for whom we've labored and prayed. Give us skill, give us wisdom, give us ability in making disciples, in winning souls to the truth, we pray. And bless each one here now as we go our separate ways. Keep each one in the hollow of thy hand, and may we each one gather together there under the tree of life in a glorious, better world, there to live with thee in heaven and the earth made new throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Is our prayer in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.